Welcome to the RNA for this week. Um, we're going to try to keep this somewhat reasonable. I realize my videos are going longer and longer as we get these readings. So I've broken this down into little short snippets that I want to talk about. Um, so for this week, we're supposed to read one quarter of our book. Um, I've actually been, ta-da, magic phone, um, listening to my book via audio uh, book. So I've been listening to this as I've been driving for back and forth to Muncie, and I've got the lower ed book. So um, I won't ruin my whole book talk with all of these points, but uh, I want to catch up on a few things that caught my uh, caught my uh, ear this week, not eye. First one was when they mentioned, so the video, or the um reading I just I have this like picture of who is actually writing this book I have to actually look it up online to kind of see if it matches yeah. my perception in my head but the voice get, has this like very uh kind and sweet uh southern lady who's reading it so all of this stuff kind of just keeps going through my head as I kind of look at these points first thing that popped up was the mentioning of education gospel and how it was being pushed, and the lower ed was filling some of the void that was there, but it was really kind of putting people in a situation where they couldn't win. So it was you have to get education because of the labor force or labor changes. So as the labor changes, you have to go in here, and then you get debt, and you can't switch because you have to continue to pay. And you'll always be going back to school to get more credentials, and then working and going and going back and doing it because there's been a shift from companies doing the education to actual institutions doing it. Institutions can't handle the technical side of it, so these for-profit colleges come in. So I, I kind of thought the education gospel reference, and now I'm a pastor of the education gospel, was really interesting. I now have a new picture of myself in the classroom. Um, filling the credential void was another point that I brought up of how it was mentioned in the book that these lower ed institutions fill the credential void, but if they weren't there, something else would be there. Um, I guess that's kind of how the market works when I look back at my econ classes. Um, but it's something interesting of like we tell this book kind of explains how bad lower ed is in essence, not overall, but in essence, it's bad for most students. And but at the same time, they're not I haven't got to the point yet where they're providing an alternative. Um, and I after being it being said that they would fill the void, it's kind of like, huh, OK, maybe let's see. We'll wait to see what happens in the rest of the book. Um, and then lower ed's a bunch of shysters. Um, I think I'd go insane if I was sitting in a meeting and they told me I needed to close on a student faster. I don't think I'd handle it. I think I, I may actually just go and explode. So um, that was just my last comment on that. Now to the rest of the readings for the week. So the first one, diversity, inclusion versus justice and equity. Um, I didn't realize when I read this one first that the language of appeasement was actually where it came from. So my comments kind of fit both of those. So as I was looking at the graphic, it's like how many colleges have actually seen this or do the leadership of the college actually understand this? I was looking through my inbox today and half the stuff on the diversity side is things that I see emails in my inbox about. It's like, come on. I mean, do you guys not understand the difference here, how you can actually be making the university a little bit better? Not complaining about the university, but I will be 100% um, honest. I didn't understand the difference between a lot of these. Um, I had some general ideas, but definitely did not have the exact differences. So it was, it was an eye-opener to me, and it probably should be shared with all members of the university community to get them some ideas of what's going on in the difference between diversity and inclusion and justice and equity. I mean, we have a, a diversity and inclusion office at Ball State. We have someone who manages that, and they're putting the diversity and inclusion uh, plan in place. I just got an email from President Mearns the other day about that plan, or is it Susie, Susie whoever the provost is, was – talking about how their excellence and inclusion or excellence and diversity plan is kind of rolling out. Did they even look at this stuff? I digress. Um, race on campus. Um, this, this was a longer read. I think it was like 37 pages I read. So I'm going to kind of break it down into the individual articles. Uh, being a black professor was eye-opening to me. I guess I never really considered it. Um, a lot of the studies I've done in this topic area have been over black students. Uh, I, I've seen articles about women in education, uh, but really haven't thought about how race plays into the role of a professor. So um, I guess I need to start thinking of some of the topics we've learned in different classes through this program on how they actually can replicate or be applied to multiple constituent groups 
or multiple groups of people or populations instead of just the one that I'm reading about. Um, I think there's still some growing for me to do. I will say that from five years ago when I started this doctoral program, was it six? I have no idea anymore how long I've been in this. But I have, my eyes have opened tremendously to the world around me and to the experiences of others. Fully get that. I probably still have the rest of my life to work and I'm still never going to be a perfect person. So um, it was interesting to think about um, how what the differences in my life would be if I was a black professor uh, because we only, we don't even, when I look at the marketing department, we only have one professor that I would think would fall into that category. And I've never really thought about that. And then there's the intersectionality of how you have that professor who is black and a female and how that kind of plays in. My mind kind of keeps going and going and going on that side of things. Um, the Invisible Labor of Minority Professors was another article. This is something I've actually read before. I can't remember what class it was in, but it was something that was basically... Uh, minority professors get brought into a bunch of different committees and a bunch of different service opportunities and advisor roles and mentor roles and all of this different stuff because of their minority status, not because they're better suited for the job, but because everybody thinks they're better suited for the job. So it kind of, in essence, overloads their um, ability to do anything because they're volunteered to do so much stuff that they can't handle all the stuff they're actually doing. Kind of interesting to me. Um, I, I did like the tips they had um, about not getting overcommitted, um, but I mean, some people could use that to their advantage. Some people can use that or don't use it and they get screwed by it. And I, I just don't know. Um, I think there's, there's a problem in the system and I don't think it's going to be changed overnight. And that leads to my next portion of victory is hard to find and putting a campus wide diversity effort. Um, I think these all kind of went together. Um, it can't just be one department, one person on campus leading a charge. It's got to be a group of people going on a long journey to make it better for people um, that can bring changes uh, for equity and justice on a campus. It's not something you're going to do overnight. It's not something you're going to do in five years. It's going to be a constant journey where you're going to have your ups and downs and problems to hop out, out in the way. So then after thinking about that, I had to think about my role in it. And the diversity in my classroom piece was obviously down there too. So um, it kind of, what I looked at is I have to try to do just a little bit more each day. Think about how I can help my students and provide that justice and equity to all my students and break down barriers or systematic changes that need to be take place in order for them to be successful at the university. I can't do it overnight. I'm not going to be perfect, but I can just try to do a little more each day. And then the being gay at Jerry Fowell's university my first comment, it's a lot of freaking nudity. The last paragraph of that was, we did, we rode four-wheelers naked. We jumped off of bridges naked. We did everything naked. A um, little strange um, to me, but teach their own. Uh, I was kind of like, wow. Uh, but this, this kind of reminded me of, I had two close friends come out as gay during my time at college. Um, first one was funny. I, I didn't know. I actually ended up living with him as my sophomore year. Had my roommate and had no idea they were gay. He mentioned it. I was like, yeah, cool. Okay, fine. And we were good friends. Never really had. He actually invited me to his wedding when he got married. Um, kind of interesting. But it wasn't a surprise to me, but at the same time, it wasn't not a surprise. Um, just it was, it was interesting. My second one was a friend that I was actually sitting in a car. And if you could imagine this, I had been drinking. I know that's a shock. Um, we were actually getting taken out to my wife's apartment and I had a close family or a close friend that who hadn't had been drinking that was going to drive me and this roommate or me and this friend out to my wife's apartment. <laughs> uh, they were talking, he started on about the Catholic church and uh, LGBT and all this stuff. And I said, but uh, shut the F up. You got to start accepting people for who they are. La, 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 la. Little did I know that the person in the car with me, my close friend, was actually gay. Um, later that night, he uh, uh, talked to me and he said, hey, Chris, thanks for sticking up for me. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, uh, thank you for what you did in the car. And I was like, okay, I, what did I do? And he goes, what do you mean? Well, I, I'm actually, I'm, I'm gay. You didn't know that? I had lived with this guy for like nine months. I had no idea. Um, and it was one of those where it's like, oh, cool. 
again, I realize there's way more to everything than just the, oh, cool, yeah, I like you for who you are kind of thing. But um, it did remind me of a few things that it's like, oh, this is different for him. Or this. Or this. Or how hard that was to even tell me. Just some things that kind of made me go, huh. So this is my RNA for the week. I hope you enjoy. And if you have any questions, just let me know. You can leave them comments below. Or you can shoot me an email or stop me when you see me on campus or whatever else you want to do. Have a great rest of the day. Bye.